So <clears throat> it was, uh, I think, 2011, 2012, somewhere, somewhere in there, give or take. I was in a meeting with the discipleship team at the, minist- at the church where I, used to, where I used to work in Indianapolis. It was late at night. Uh, there was you know, six or seven of us around uh, the conference table. And all of a sudden, we hear this like knock on the window. Now, this window is high up, so you can't, you can't really see who's through it. They had to, you, know, you have to reach up to knock on this window. And we're like, you know, what was that? And so then all of a sudden, there's, a, there's another knock. Now, my, the thoughts that are going through my mind, I mean, this is like 8 o'clock, 7, 7, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, our discipleship team meetings had a tendency to, to go long. I'm, I'm sure that's a shock to you. <clears throat> so uh, so it, was, it was pretty late. And I thought maybe it was the older gentleman that lived across the street from the church who was pretty nosy, and he would just come into the building whenever he wanted to to see what was going on. It happened all the time. It was incredibly frustrating, and I thought that's who it was. But I go out to the front door, and there's this uh, woman there, uh, probably in her uh, 40s or so, and she has uh, a child with her, and she's in need of assistance. And so I, I do what is, you know, policy. I, I uh, take her driver's license, I, I photocopy it, and then I go and get her a Kroger uh, card, which allows her to buy groceries and gas, and give that to her. Uh, right by our front door, there was a, a donation table, which had some, uh, like, cleaning supplies, like Tide, Cheer, that kind of stuff. And she said, you know, would it be okay if I took one of these? So I was like, sure. And she went on her way. So the next day, uh, I'm telling the staff, uh, the senior minister, the worship minister, the church secretary, and I, and uh, I'm telling the staff what, what happened, what transpired. And so uh, I shared the details. A couple hours later, the senior minister walks into my office. And I just want to stress this was not, you know, this is not here, all right? This was the previous church. The senior minister walks into my office, and he says, Jonathan, I... I just was wondering, maybe how could you have handled that situation differently? I was like, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I did what we do. And he then began to kind of lead me in the way of thinking that this woman was there just asking for a handout, probably even maybe scamming you. It was late at night. You didn't need to even answer the door to begin with. Uh, and he, he said, and I quote, Jonathan, you need to learn to harden your heart to those kinds of situations. And see, it wasn't Mark, okay? <laughs> it wasn't Mark. And I, honestly, I, I didn't know what to say. I was speechless, and you all know that's a big deal to me. <laughs> so so I, was, I was pretty speechless. I was like, wow, I, I didn't think anyone would ever say that to me let alone the senior minister of a church. And so, I, you know, I, I think he had good intentions. You know, I didn't think, I think he didn't want me to be taken advantage of, to, to not be so naive. You know, I, I was still pretty new to the ministry, uh, one of my early first times having to do one of those things. But uh, to be honest with you, I, is that how I'm supposed to love my neighbor is by hardening my heart towards them? Like, is that what I'm supposed to do? I really struggled with that. I really struggled with that. And I even called my mom. <laughs> now, do you remember that? Yeah. yeah I, and she was so flabbergasted, she called her brother, who's a minister. <laughs> and so, I mean, it just was bizarre. So I, I wanted to maybe think about how are we supposed to love our neighbor, right? How are we supposed to show the, and demonstrate the love of God? So what I want to do is I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter. Right? This is the chapter that they read at weddings. Right? So uh, we're just going to read the whole chapter, right? and then we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. It says, verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can re- uh, remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I gave away everything I own, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I receive no benefit. 
Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious. Love does not brag. It is not puffed up. It is not rude. It is not self-serving. It is not easily angered or resentful. It is not glad about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But if there are prophecies, they will be set aside. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be set aside. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when one is perfect comes, the partial will be set aside. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became an adult, I set aside childish ways. For now we see in a mirror indirectly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. But so that was uh, from the New English translation, my favorite translation. Uh, if we were to go old school and we were to get out and dust off our old King James Bibles and we were to open up that to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, do you all know uh, what word appears in the place of love? Because the word love never appears in this chapter in the King James Bible. Do you know what word appears there? Charity. Charity. Only recently did they start reading this at weddings. And honestly, I think the word charity is a better translation for the Greek word that's there, which is the word agape, right? The, the big word of love in the New Testament, agape. I think charity is probably a better translation. It's more directive. It's more focused on, on the kind of love that we are to show. I do think we can still do better still. Which I want to now, it's time to mention the sermon series that we've been in, right? As we, as we work through this idea of love and charity, we've been in a sermon series that looked at faith, hope, and now love. And we've been looking at phrases that don't necessarily appear in Scripture, but oftentimes people think that they do. So we've called this, jokingly, thus saith not the Lord, right? Because God never actually said it. Thus the not, right? So... Thus saith not the Lord, and we looked at phrases like inviting Jesus into your heart, or uh, this too shall pass, or, or uh, you know, it must be part of God's plan. Uh, today we're going to look at two phrases that are not actually in the Bible, but sometimes mistaken as though that they are from Scripture, and they are going to help us understand this concept of biblical charity or biblical love. And so the question I want to ask for us to, to work through and come up with an answer to today is, how do we live out biblical charity? How do we live out biblical charity? I want to look at these two phrases that people often believe are from the Bible, but are in fact not, and then address how these phrases might damage agape love. All right? Now, I need to begin with a disclaimer, okay? Now, the two phrases that we're going with today are not necessarily unbiblical ideas, okay? So, a couple in the past, I have, you know, just whole rejected that is not actually what the Bible says at all, and it can be very damaging. I think you can make a case for some of the, for, for, for at least one of these, if not both of them, uh, so I, I just don't think that they give us a full picture on what charity or New Testament or biblical charity really is. And here's the first phrase that I want to look at. If you give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. If you teach a man a fish, he will eat, eat for a lifetime, eat for life. Yeah, right? It's, it's a great phrase. It, it really has a lot of truth and meaning into it, but no, it, it doesn't actually appear in Scripture. So this phrase is actually only about 120 years old. It comes uh, at least appears in a book, so, you know, like our first written record of this phrase, comes from the 19th century, more specifically, a writer named Anne Isabella Thackeray Ritchie. That's a name. She wrote the saying down in a novel of hers called Mrs. Diamond. It was published in 1885. Now, here's my issue. I, ha I, have, I have a couple issues with this phrase. Again, I, I think it gives very important truth. 
but there are some issues that I have. I think it ignores the immediate need that ought to be addressed before you can elevate somebody out of their plight, out of their situation. Right? The phrase jumps towards the long-term solution, but those long-term solutions aren't going to do any good if they are still worried about their, 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 their stomach, their belly. They need food. Right? They need shelter. They need clothing. They need the, the basic essentials. And this statement jumps kind of over that and says we need to go towards long-term solutions, which is absolutely true. And it, but if you try to teach somebody a skill, uh, th- it's not going to do any good if they're just starving. Right? That's why teachers give children, young children especially, snacks all throughout the day because people listen better. They, they are better students. They learn better if they have a full belly. So they don't have to focus on their stomach and the urgings and the cravings of their stomach. So I think, I think this phrase ignores the immediate situation. The other issue that I have is that many people believe that poverty is a question of irresponsibility or laziness. And so this kind of assumes that somebody doesn't have an essential skill that, or anything that they can just you know, go out and get a job, so you need to teach them something uh, because they're, they're too stupid. They don't know it. They don't know it already. And there's no doubt there are lots of people in this world who don't want to get a job because they're lazy. I, I, I have to make room for that because that's, a, that's a, a huge reality in our world. However, mo- I would say most of the people in poverty in the world today, are, they're not in poverty because they're lazy. Maybe it's where they grew up. Maybe it's the home life w- that they grew up in. Not all of us had a stable home life where we didn't have to worry about them uh, having three square meals a day, about having a shelter, uh, a roof over our head. Lots of people grew up in a home where their parents made bad decisions because their parents made bad decisions and their parents made bad decisions and they're stuck in this cycle of making bad decisions and they can't get out because what you've been brought up in is what you know. And so sometimes there's lots of people who are stuck in poverty because that's all they know. All they know is how to survive. They don't know how to thrive. Now, this next phrase is probably more mistaken as being from the Bible, but I would argue is probably the less biblical of the two, and it's God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. All right, uh, full disclosure, all right, uh, one of my first classes in seminary, all right, this is not Bible college. This is master level biblical studies. And I'm listening to a a fellow student who is giving a lecture on charity and how we're supposed to be charitable and and all the things that we're supposed to do. And it started challenging my thinking about about people, about poverty, and about those sorts of things. And I'm thinking in my head, but doesn't the Bible say, like, God helps those who help themselves? And I, I said that out loud to the class. Now... The, the, the gentleman who was sitting next to me, who was actually a, a very close friend of the family, gently leaned over, and he said, Jonathan, uh, I think that's one of those things that sounds like it's from the Bible, but it's really not. And I, you know, my face beat red, panicked, right? Because I just now realized I looked like a major idiot in front of the whole class. And sure enough, I did a quick little Google search, not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. Now, this phrase has been around since before Jesus, in fact. But it was brought into the English language in the 1600s and used also by Benjamin Franklin. Ancient Greek philosophers used variations of this thought. And it's used to underscore the importance of self-reliance, to stand on your own two feet and to find pride in that you have helped yourself. You've built yourself up by your, by your bootstraps. Right? You've been standing on your own two feet. But again, there's a couple issues that we have. The first is, if I'm supposed to ask God to help, sh- shouldn't I try to fix the situation myself first? Do you hear what's wrong in that? 
the mentality that I'm supposed to try and fix the problem, then I go to God to see if he can help me further? No, that's, that's the complete opposite, right? Because we are, in stu- we are stuck in sin. We, we couldn't help ourselves. We have to go to God first. God has to be the one who helps us first. Only then can we begin to help ourselves. So if someone, and then the other is, if someone is going to receive help, they need to do their fair share first, right? They need to do their fair share, their fair share first. This is, this is wrong. If, if somebody's coming to your door and coming to the doors of the church, which happens all the time, and they're needing assistance, I'm not going to sit there and ask, well, you know, what have you done already? You know, what have you done already to get yourself out of this situation? That's just not something I'm going to ask because I need to address the immediate need. It, this is, I think, perhaps the, one of the ideas that we have regarding people who are like on, on corners, right, or outside like Walmart or something like that, and they have the signs, right, and they are, they're asking for a handout. What, the last time that Erica and I went to Harry and Izzy's to celebrate our anniversary, downtown Indianapolis. It's our favorite place to go. There was lined up on the street curb like five, six, eight couples or people who were obviously homeless looking, sitting on the curb, waiting for the people to come out with their leftovers so they could eat the leftovers of the people coming out of Harry and Izzy's. Which, I mean, if you're going to like ask for some food, like Harry and Izzy's is the place you want to hang out, <laughs> right? It's like Ruth's Chris or something along those lines, right? This is a primo steakhouse. So Eric and I were like, yeah, okay, well, you know, we were going to be walking around downtown. The food wasn't going to be good anyways by the time we got, uh, got home. And so we handed our, our doggy bag to a young couple that was hunched over. They looked rather pathetic, if I'm being honest. And uh, the guy just kind of took the bag, placed it behind him, and they just assumed their positions again. Didn't say anything, not even a thank you, I mean, nothing. And we just, like, okay, so we just went on our way. But I felt like we did the right thing because, I mean, it wasn't going to benefit us any. It was cost us nothing. They can have the food. So if you give a man a fish and God helps those who help themselves, sound like something Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, which I'm sure you all are thinking right now in the back of your head. But Jonathan, doesn't the Bible say if you don't work, you don't eat? You heard that before? If you don't work, you don't eat? Yeah, the Bible does say that. The Bible does say that, right? Then that's in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. It's the second half of the verse. This is what the text actually says, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, neither should he eat. Now, Paul wrote this to address his work ethic for two reasons. All right. So first, I want to go to the passage. Let's put this in context because context is king, right? So we need to make sure we're reading this passage in context. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 6 and go through verse 13. This is what Paul says. But when we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who lives an undisciplined life and, and not according to the tradition they received from us, for you know yourselves how you must imitate us, because we did not behave without, without discipline among you. And we did not eat anyone's food without paying. Instead, in toil and drudgery, we worked night and day in order not to burden any. Like, you see the rich language that he's, he's putting there with toil and drudgery? It, it's funny to me. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give ourselves as an example for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, Neither should he eat. For we hear that some among you are living an undisciplined life, not doing your own work, but meddling in the work of others. Now such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and so provide their own food to eat. But you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing 
what is right. So there's two reasons that Paul addressed this situation in Thessalonica. Okay? The first is is that he doesn't want to be accused of being lazy. Right? He doesn't want to be accused of being lazy or a burden on the church. You notice he said, I have the right to request from you these things, but I wasn't going to do that. He's an apostle. He... He likes, to, he likes to do that from time to time. I am an apostle, and I could request this of you, but I'm not going to do that. Right? And this is one of the instances where he does that. And so he's like, no, I worked hard. I worked like a dog so that I could not only preach the good news to you, but I could also support my own way so I wasn't a burden on the church. He was trying to set a good example. And we know that Paul did this because of the book of Acts. We know that he was a tent maker, and that's what he did. So he wanted to set a good example. He wanted to make sure that he wasn't a drain on the community because he was there for probably a a year or so, and he didn't want to to be a burden on the people, and he didn't want that to be a barrier between him and the people in his delivery of the message. Oh, here's Paul again. I had to buy him dinner the other day. He didn't want that to be an issue. The other issue that Paul is probably dealing with is the idea of patronage, okay? So Thessalonica is on the coast, right? And so in the winter months, there's no, there's no boats coming in. And if there's no boats coming in, there's no economy. There's no money coming in. That's, I mean, that's where your work is, is unloading the boats. And so if there's no money, then people begin to starve. Now, This practice was widely done throughout the Roman Empire, but really heavily in towns like Thessalonica where it was seasonal work. And so what would would happen is they'd have these rich people that lived in the town, like uber-rich people, okay? And they would basically pay people to be their friends. They would pay, they would, you know, give uh, uh, tons of money to the community to have the statue uh, of them or, or an arena or something like that so they could get their name on the building, you know, that kind of thing, right? And so the, the idea of patronage, and there was Christians in the church who were probably paying other Christians to be in the church. Something along those lines. This idea of patronage. And Paul is saying, no, we don't do that. That's not how things are done. And so he's having to address the issue because it's not just that they need to work to support themselves, but they need to work so that they can help support the community so that they can be uh, uh, beneficial to the people of God. They need to be a blessing to others. And in verse 13, he even says, but you brothers and sisters do not grow weary in doing what is right. Meaning just because somebody's taken advantage of you in the past doesn't mean that that needs to be, uh, that the punishment needs to come down on the people who come after them. Right? The, the people who follow after them asking for money. Don't take out their misdeeds on other people who come later asking for help. Do not grow weary in doing what is right. You see, these phrases, if you don't work, you don't eat, or if you give a man a fish, or, they neglect the complexity of poverty and can lead believers down a path that thinks the poor are in their situation because they deserve to be. While they may certainly be, this may certainly be the case in many situations, it's not always the reason. And thinking that way leads to hardening your heart towards your neighbors. All right? So charity can be a powerful to, tool to the kingdom when used properly. So we need to let, we, we need to use charity for the purpose of advancing God's kingdom. Now, here's, here's what I mean by that, right? Let's look at some New Testament examples of charity, right? So Jesus and the New Testament authors, they perform charitable giving because that is what God's people do. That's what God's people do. Jesus fed the 5,000. He also fed uh, 4,000. Jesus in Matthew 5, 42 says, Give to the one who asks you and do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. James wrote, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can this kind of faith save him? 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them what the body needs, what good is that? Hebrews author says in chapter 13, verse 1, following brotherly love must continue. Do not neglect hospitality because through it some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them and those ill-treated as though you too felt their torment. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive and 1 John 3 says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother and sister in need and closes his heart against them, how does the love of God remain in him? How does the love of God remain in him? You see, the word for love that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 13 and throughout these passages that I've been reading to you, as I've stated earlier, is the Greek word agape. We've all, I'm sure, heard the word agape at some point, right? It's, it's just one of those Greek words that every Christian seems to know because we've all studied it at some point. It has minimal use outside of the New Testament, so it seems to be a very Christian word. It appears most condensedly in the Bible. No, no, other, no other ancient resource really uses this word at all. They use other words for the word love. So it's a very Christian word. And as I said, I really like how the KJV translates it as charity. Though I'm not sure that that really fits every situation or every occurrence that we see in the New Testament. And I'm certainly not saying we all need to go out and buy King James Bibles. It is to, agape means to love without expecting anything in return. Right? Perhaps it's best to understand agape as compassion or mercy or maybe even pity. But here's the definition that I've come to admire the most. Agape love is a love that takes responsibility for others who can't be responsible for themselves. Right? Agape love is a love that takes responsibility for others who can't be responsible for themselves. And you know how I know that this is a good definition? Because Paul says almost the exact same thing in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, because it always comes back to Romans, right? Always comes back to Romans. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his own agape for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Meaning, while we were unable to take responsibility for our own sin, to bear the punishment of our shame, to bear the, the, the penalty of our sin, God acted on our behalf. He took responsibility for us when we couldn't do it ourselves, and he took that burden of shame upon him and bared it and nailed it to the cross. You know what word we would use to describe someone like that today? A hero. We call him a hero. So here are four takeaways when we view charity in this way. Here's four things that we can take away that helps us live out this agape of taking responsibility for others who can't be responsible for themselves. The first is, is to love purposefully. To love purposefully. We can spread the kingdom of God by being generous, right? I already mentioned Jesus fed the 4,000. He fed the 5,000. He was feeding people left and right. And he knows in a, in a society where there was lots of, of poverty, if he met their immediate need, then he will be able to speak to them on a whole new level. And so when it came to feeding the 5,000, the whole reason why he did it was because it was dinner time and the, he was, the people were going to leave. If he fed them, they would stay, which means he'd be able to preach longer. If he feel, and he, felt, he fills their belly, therefore, they don't have any problem listening to him because they're not worried about their stomach. Right? I mean, it's as simple as that. He met the immediate need. That's why we give kids snacks in school. 
We also need to love wisely. Love wisely. We need to be wise like serpents, innocent as doves, because there are people out there who are trying to take advantage of our love and generosity. And so we need to listen to their stories. We need to check that they are legitimate. Do you all remember the story that Mark told, oh, about a month ago or so, when he was talking about an example of charity that he gave on behalf of the church? It was a woman who was claiming that they were, she was from Pennsylvania, and her, uh, her parents were coming the next day to come get them. They were, in the meantime, in a, in a motel in Anderson, but originally from Newcastle, and, uh, and they, he, they wanted dinner, maybe, just, and just one night in the motel to their parents. You guys remember that story? All right, because they really wanted the brownies. Remember that? And they were disappointed when they didn't get a brownie. Okay, let's fast forward about two or three weeks, right? The phone rings. Mark's not here, so I take it. It's the same woman. And Jonathan answers the phone now, and you know he has no heart, right? And so I answer the phone, and I, I, I take it. I, Now, to be honest with you, I wasn't sure at first, but some of the story that she was telling me, it was just similar enough to what Mark had said that I'm like, you know what? I need to check our church policy on something. You are in Anderson, so let me just check. So I took her number. I was going to call her back later. I called Mark, and I'm like, listen, I think this might be the same person. Here's the story. He's like, oh, no. Yeah, that's her. That's her. We're not, no, we've already helped her. We're not helping again. And I said, okay, cool, I'll, uh, I'll deal with this. And so I, I call her back, and I, I'm, I'm polite, very polite. I said, I'm sorry, it's against our policy right now that we, you know, you're not in our area, so we're not going to be able to help you. We just ask that you maybe find a church or someplace up in Anderson that might be able to help. You know, she turned nasty real quick. She began to come up with uh, some creative ways of raising money herself to pay for her night in the hotel. And at that point, I was like, okay, have fun, and I hung up. Because w- we were done, right? She was just trying to guilt me into giving her money, which was not happening. It's not going to happen. So we need to, be, we need to love wisely, wh- right? We need to love wisely. However, let me say, if I had to fall on one side or the other of being perhaps considered more naive and helping the people versus being more stingent uh, in in our helping or in our benevolence, I want to lean more on the side that gives some grace. Because here's why. That's what I've been commanded to do from Scripture, and God will deal with their injustice. And he can do a much better job than I ever could. And just like Paul said, I can't let that instance discourage me from doing good to the next person. The next person can't suffer because the person before them lied. And I think we fall into that trap. I think we fall into that trap, and that's how our hearts become hard over time. The third thing we need to do is to love contagiously. Love contagiously. We need to be generous and with what God has given us, right? We need we've been blessed, so we need to be a blessing. God's blessed us to be a blessing to the world, and that's how our love is going is 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 to work by our our love overpouring, demonstrating God's love, God's agape to the world. That's how we're supposed to reach the world. Is by demonstrating this contagious. Love. And here's a great example of that. A church in Hamilton, Ohio, named Hamilton Christian Center, ordered a pizza from Marco's Pizza on Christmas Eve for their Christmas Eve service. One pizza for everybody in the room. Hundreds of people in the room. And uh, the delivery man comes, and he's ushered into the church, like, really kind of confused at this point. He just wants to deliver a pizza. And he's led down the side of the room, and he's led up to the senior pastor who's standing there. And at this time, he's not only just confused, he's extremely nervous about what's going to happen, right? And so uh, he's standing there holding the Marcos, you know, 
heat warming pizza, and the senior pastor puts his arm around them and says, uh, you know, thank you very much for delivering the pizza today. Here's the money. What's the biggest tip you've ever gotten? Uh, like ten dollars. So he, the senior pastor, pulls out a ten dollar bill and says, well, here, I, w- you know, I want to match that generosity. The guy was extremely thankful. He was. He was, uh, you know, surprised, shocked, no less. But then the senior pastor said, but you know what? The rest of us want to tip you as well. And at that moment, the whole church rose to their feet and began to make a line down the, the center aisle. And one by one, the hundreds of people in that worship center handed him $1 bills, $5 bills, $10 bills. And by the time the whole church had gone through and sat back down, he had a stack of cash that tall. And he's, I mean, shocked and flabbergasted at the generosity and and the love of the people. And uh, not only did they have to pick him up off the ground, but, you know, they had to count the money, right? And by the time they counted everything, it was over $3,000. That's quite a tip, especially at Christmas when money is so tight for so many people. Well, this story, as you can imagine, creates all kind of buzz and electricity, and it catches the local news, and so it begins to make it cycle around, and, you know, there's lots of negative people in the world. They begin to criticize, oh, well, he's going to have to pay taxes on all of that. No joke. Like, that's what happened. And so the church even wrote the man a check to cover the taxes. Right? That's the kind of charity, that's the kind of agape love that is contagious, that you want to be a part of. You want to be a part of something like that, and you want to share that story. And the people in the church were just as excited to, to give this man uh, a few dollars as the man was to receive the 3000 You know, uh, when I was doing research for this particular story, all the churches that I could find an example of that did that were from Ohio. I'm, I'm not even kidding. Not even kidding. The fourth and final thing that we're supposed to do is to love appropriately. Love appropriately. We need to know when helping turns to hurting. Right? We've addressed the uh, immediate need. We've been helping them for a while, but eventually you might become an enabler. And they have, no then, they have no need then to rise above their own situation if you continue to help them. And it's at that point when you need to th- start thinking long-term solutions. What job can we help them get? What ministry can we help them get involved with that might address these long-term problems? What counselor can I invite them or, or, or take them to that might help some of the baggage that they've brought from their own childhood that keeps leading them in this cycle of making bad decisions? At some point, our generosity turns into hurting and we become an enabler and we need to know that there are long-term solutions that need to be addressed and we need to then make that transition. So let me ask you, in 1 Corinthians 13, the passage ends, the famous love passage ends with these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Have you ever asked that question? I mean, look at the list. They're all pretty important. Faith. Right? You are saved by grace through faith. Faith is pretty important towards our salvation. Without faith, there is no salvation. There is no grace. There is no eternal life. Faith is pretty important. What about hope? Right? It's hope that gets us through our lives. It's hope that takes us towards the future of heaven and an eternity with him. Hope is pretty important. It's what gets us through the difficult times. What about love? You see, love is the one that remains, or maybe a better way to say it is endures. Because it's the only one of the three that will remain or endure into eternity. Have you ever thought about that? In heaven, there's no need for faith. Because you're with God. There's no need to have faith in God if you're with God. You know he's there. He's right there. 
There's no need for hope because you've already attained. You've been given. You've received. There is no more need for hope. There's no more hard times to get through. Hope is done. The only one that remains of the three in eternity is love. And that is why it is the greatest of the three. By taking responsibility for our neighbors, that's the only thing that will be left in all of eternity is for us to share generously with all the other people that are with us in the new earth. And we see glimpses of that here and now. We see glimpses of that eternal love here in our world around us. And here's one such example. I may have told this story before, and it's one of those stories that preachers love to tell. It's been around. But I did some research, and as far as I can tell, this is true. In the 1930s, a rather unusual court case came to pass in New York City where Mary where Mayor LaGuardia presided. And uh, a woman was charged with stealing bread. Okay, and she was poor, and she was taking care of her child and her grandchildren. Her, her, her daughter, uh, her daughter's husband had just left them. They were destitute, nowhere to go. This poor woman had no money to, to buy food for, these, for, for her family, and so she resulted to stealing bread. The shopkeeper refused to drop charges. Right? He was going to make an example out of this woman because this was a bad neighborhood, and he didn't want his business to be at future risk. If you let this woman go, everyone else is going to know that they can just steal from us, and there's no consequences. Right? So he was going to make an example of her. And so he brings her to court, and he charges this against her. And, and Mayor LaGuardia, who sometimes was able to actually sit in and be a magistrate of the court, See, New York has these special rules, or at least they did at the time, where the mayor could do that sort of thing. And from time to time, he was known for taking special cases, listening, and giving his judgment. And he was known for being fair but firm. And he presides over this court. He hears the case, and he says, you're absolutely right, shopkeeper. She is guilty as charged. Charge her $10. Right? I mean, it's 1930s. $10 is a lot. Right? Uh, charge her $10. If she can't pay that, 10 days in jail. And the shopkeeper's excited. Oh, justice is coming my way. And, but then the whole court became really quiet and quite shocked at what they saw next as he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a $10 bill and he placed it in his hat on the, on the desk. And he said, her debt is paid in full. What kind of justice is that? She's going to get off scot-free. You're going to let this woman go, the shopkeeper thought to himself. But the mayor wasn't done. He said, and now I'm going to institute a new tax. Everyone in this room has, is going to be charged 50 cents for living in a city where a woman has to steal bread to feed her children and grandchildren. And he passed the hat around the room and collected the money from the people and gave that money to the woman to buy bread. See, that's the kind of generosity that is infectious. It's the kind that takes responsibility for others who can't be responsible for themselves. That is what agape love is all about. And it leads me to my, my, my bottom line, my, my challenge for all of us today. See, we need to love others the way God loves you. Love others the way God loves you. He took responsibility for you when no one else could and no one else was willing. And he told us, I've loved you, now go love the world. Go love the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for everything that you have blessed us with so that we could be generous with the things that you've given us so that we could give infectious love and we could be responsible for others who can't be responsible for themselves father we ask that you lay on our hearts the 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 need to be generous to be charitable with others and not let our hearts become closed or stiff or hard against those that might be asking for money. 
Uh, Father, we, we ask that you reveal to us opportunities for us to be charitable in new ways. Show us the ways uh, of your love and, and lead us in, in, in the places where we can demonstrate your love. And, and with that, we can spread the kingdom, your kingdom. Let, uh, let our agape show the world that you are the true king, that you are God, and that you are who you say you are. Lord, we ask that you show us how to love others with the, with the responsibility of, uh, and love and strength that you had, that you showed responsibility for others. Lord, we ask these things in the name of your Son, who is the Christ. Amen. And now is the time for you.